cumulative ones or it'll go down. Great, okay, thanks very much. Uh, for the next half hour or so, I'm gonna talk about some of the big technology challenges that we're facing as the internet becomes ever more pervasive in our daily lives. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about Akamai. Uh, most of you probably use Akamai, but probably most of you never heard of it before. We're sort of in the back end of the, behind the curtain in the internet. And uh, also a little bit about how Akamai got started. You know, around 20 years ago, uh, we had some interesting mathematical ideas, completely impractical. Uh, we had absolutely no knowledge of business. Unfortunately, the Desponde Center wasn't there for us 20 years ago, but you know, we were able to leverage some help for other MIT organizations to actually get a, a company started. And I guess I'm, I'm living proof that uh, it is possible, if you've got a good idea and you have no knowledge about business, that it is possible to make a difference with technology, uh, with help uh, from folks that are here today. Uh, I'm gonna start with a video that I think does a, a pretty nice job of putting into context the tremendous pace of change you know, that we've seen with technology and the impact that it's having on our lives. So if we could uh, roll that. I wonder though, what sort of a life would it be like in social terms? I mean, if our whole life is built around the computer, we would become a computer-dependent society.
You know, it, it really is amazing everything that's happened with technology. And, you know, I look at my kids and they just think the world was always that way. Uh, you know, some of you are old enough like me to remember that it wasn't always that way. But I think the most exciting thing is that we're just at the beginning. The pace of innovation and technology is accelerating. Of course, today, everyone and everything around us is getting connected. Uh, you know, billions of people, tens of billions of devices, and countless petabytes of data. And some people call this the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, the hyper-connected world. But whatever you call it, it's creating really enormous expectations. People just expect that all the people, all the devices, all the data will be instantly and intelligently connected at their fingertips. Now, these expectations are hard to really satisfy. And there are four grand challenges that I think we need to solve to make the expectations become a reality. The first is that you'd like to have instant performance for any device anywhere. Now, you all know if you take that cellular device, especially uh, you know, if it's in a crowded city and you click, it is not instant. And that's sort of weird because when you bought the latest device, that's the cool new technology, the expectation is it ought to be a lot faster than that old clunky thing on your desk. And it's not. It's slower. The web has to be secure. Now, of course, we all know it's not. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse, there's some new dire revelation of what happened to some poor company or individual or government, some horrendous thing that happened online. You know, there's a, a fantasy that may soon become a reality, at least uh, a lot of people would like it to become a reality, that when a few billion people go home at night and in prime time, they can watch a high quality video over IP. Okay, and they can all do that at the same time. Uh, that's a big challenge. And finally, in the enterprise workforce, there's a, a huge need today as applications move online, as employees move to the popular consumer mobile device, to make the enterprise network be fast, scalable, affordable, and secure. So what I'm going to do today is talk about each of these four challenges. Uh, they're great areas to start a company in. They're areas that we're working really hard on at Akamai. And then I'll say a little bit about what Akamai does. So first, the challenge of making the web really be instant. This problem gets harder every year. Now, normally with technology, things get always faster and cheaper. You know, but in fact, if you take a typical website today, unassisted, it's getting slower. And the reason for that is a typical web page has gotten a lot heavier. There's more content there. It's richer content. Might even be a video. It's more than twice the size. And by way the, the way the technology works, if it's twice the size, it's going to take twice the time. There's a lot more objects on the page. And a lot more users are accessing through mobile devices and through cellular networks. And cellular networks are incredibly slow. So the average download speeds are much worse today than they were even a couple of years ago for a typical web page for the typical user. Now, the mobile internet or the cellular internet is slow because that infrastructure was not built to do the internet. It was built for voice. And voice communicates at about 8,000 or 16,000 bits per second. And right now, the pages you want to get you know, if you want that in a page, you've got to do a million bits a second. And you want to get some fancy video, a high-def video of the, the soccer match or the baseball game, that could be up to 10 million bits a second. Isn't going to happen using this infrastructure, at least in the way we use it today. We need technology to figure out how to get around a core barrier. Speed really does matter. Uh, pretty much whatever you're doing. And this is a famous study by Walmart. And what it shows here in the blue bars is the histogram of download times for users. And so you see sort of maybe the median user out here at six seconds. You got a bunch of users out here at more than 11 seconds to download a page. And then the orange bar is the conversion rate. 
And what this means is that if you're taking 11 seconds to download, download a Walmart web page, you bought nothing from Walmart. If you're in under a second, you bought a lot from Walmart. So Walmart looks at this, as does every other major e-commerce site, and says, boy, I want my pages to come be fast, because they make a lot more money. Companies that have you know, consumer portals, you know, B2B portals, anything they're doing business online, if it's faster, they're doing more business, more productively. So really important for business to be fast. Second grand challenge is security. Nothing is safe on the internet. Just, you look at the headlines every day, new headlines. Look what happened to Sony. They had Sony Entertainment. All their financial records wiped out. They had to ask their customers and partners what the contract said. All their sensitive emails exposed. Incredibly embarrassing. That's just the latest. You know, uh, we look at Akamai, and we carry a lot of websites, and I'll talk a little bit about what we do. But we look at the progression of denial of service attacks. These are attacks meant to bring down a website, take it off the air. And you see over the last several years, they're, just, they're growing at a very rapid rate. Today, the typical attack, every day we'll see an attack of about 50 gigabits a second of DOS traffic. That is junk being hurled at the website. At a rate, there's only a handful, I can count them on one hand, of websites in the world that can tolerate that capacity. The others, just all the rest, can't begin to afford it. And large attacks now get to hundreds of billions of bits per second. Enormous volumes of junk that just wipe out the website and everything near it. And it becomes possible, impossible for websites to defend themselves. And so you have whole crime industries now around cyber extortion that come out of Asia, Eastern Europe. You know, there's all sorts of groups now, governments, uh, political organizations, hacktivists, uh, just anybody, crime, anybody with a cause, for all sorts of reasons. You know, there's dozens of groups out of the Middle East, each with a different agenda, trying to get their message out there. And there are all sorts of tools. In fact, the leading researchers develop tools so that you can test them against your site to defend yourself, but before you have a chance, the hackers get them and use them to exploit your website, steal your credit cards and your private information, change the content on your site. And if that wasn't bad enough, the core protocols that the internet uses and has been using forever seem to all have massive vulnerabilities. You know, just last year, there were some very famous ones. One of them was Heartbleed. Now, Heartbleed was a vulnerability discovered in OpenSSL. What's that? Well, whenever you do anything online with your credit card or with sensitive information, it needs to be encrypted. Because if it's not encrypted, somebody will just grab all that stuff online that's listening in, and, and they'll have your credit card, they'll have your bank account information, they, they would own your identity. Very bad. So there's encryption on the internet. And the encryption algorithm that's used is SSL. Actually, it's closely related to technology that was developed at MIT long ago, RSA, Ravesh Shavir and Adelman. Now, the protocol that everybody uses for SSL is an open standard protocol. It's open source. And people generally like open source because it's trusted. It wasn't made by a government that might have ulterior motives. Everybody can bang on it and make sure it's safe. Well, last year, it was discovered publicly that the OpenSSL algorithm had a huge vulnerability that let pretty much anybody steal the secret key. Anybody who had, you know, halfway intelligent. Now, who knows how long the governments and the criminal organizations knew about this. Uh, at Akamai, you know, we were shocked. Uh, we, we used OpenSSL. But we, and so we asked some of our security experts that didn't, didn't know what the vulnerability was. We said, there's a, a vulnerability in OpenSSL that allows people to steal the secret keys easily. Find it. it. Took them 30 minutes. And it had been out there for years. And so any government that's paying attention, or criminal organization paying attention, should have known and could have listen to every encrypted communication on the internet. 
for years. I mean, that's just, and that's only one of the big things that was exposed last year. You know, it's, um, so even, it's just, it's the core infrastructure is highly vulnerable. That's a big challenge. Um, the next grand challenge is how do we all go home at night and watch high quality video over IP? It's coming. Everybody is now talking about their over the top or OTT service and cutting the cord and things like this because we all want to just get what we want when we want it, which is, means over the internet. Uh, these are just some stats of the growth of internet traffic. Uh, you know, we deliver things like the Olympics and the World Cup, and we're seeing current growth rates of traffic for an event of about 63% every year. That's the number of bits that we would deliver per second for everybody watching the World Cup or the Olympics. Uh, across our platform as a whole, it's growing at over 60% a year and has been for some time. So if you look at Akamai, how much traffic uh, that we're delivering, uh, right now as I speak, we're delivering over 26 trillion bits every second. That's, that's a lot. It's hard to imagine how much that is. Uh, but the key is you see historically just how fast it's growing here. And then you could uh, ask the question, well, where does it go from here? How much traffic could there be on the internet? All right, so we could, we could try to do that with some math. I won't do the normal thing of just take 60% forever, you know, because who knows if it keeps growing that fast. So let's think about it. Suppose you got two and a half billion people that want to watch a video in prime time. There are two and a half billion people already that watch video on the internet. They don't do it every night, but they will watch some video on the internet. And suppose they want to watch at pretty good quality. That comes out to be about 10 million bits a second. Now, to put that in context, standard deaf TV, that old thing that is not so good anymore, that's one to two million bits per second. DVD, not Blu-ray, DVD, four to five million bits a second. Blu-ray, well, 20 to 40 million bits a second. Now, sometimes that'll get compressed into what's called HD TV, and you can compress it all you want, but the picture doesn't look so good anymore. Uh, new technology coming out called 4K. And we don't have, most people don't have 4K TVs yet, but they're starting to come down in price and people are trying to figure out when that really hits the market. Compressed to the point where it still looks good is 16 million bits a second. 8K is on the horizon. And I gotta tell you, once you have it, you don't want anything less. That old thing just doesn't look good anymore, even though it was great five years ago. So say we're just at 10 megs. That's not as good as 4K. Um, it's better than DVD, not as good as Blu-ray. All right, but say that's what the standard becomes out there. And now let's do the math. That's 25,000 trillion bits per second. Now I just told you that we're delivering 25 per second right now. And we carry a lot of the traffic on the internet. So if we tried to plot that, well, you, you can't meaningfully plot it. Because this is 25, that's 25,000. And in fact, it means the growth rates are going to accelerate the annual growth rate from here. Now, I don't know when this hits. You know, there's a lot coming this year. You're going to see announcements through the year with everybody coming over the top. Big names coming out with some very interesting packages. That might be the catalyst. But oh my goodness, that's a huge leap, discontinuity in traffic. And this is, you know, again, leading to people to ask the question, which they asked 15 years ago, will video break the internet? Now, it hasn't yet, although we're seeing the stress signs now. And you see this played out with the net neutrality arguments, where Netflix is crying foul because they're trying to get the videos through the peering points, and, and they can't get the quality they want into your home. And they're saying the big bad carriers are the reason. Actually, the biggest reason is we're congested at the peering points in the core of the internet. That's the biggest reason. And some countries are in a lot worse shape than we are already with just current levels. 
Now, interestingly, a lot of people, when they, they think about, well, where's the bottleneck on the internet, they think it's in the connections to the homes. It's not. Uh, if you look at the last mile connections, well, most of you probably have, what, 25 meg, 100 meg already into your home. That's plenty good to get a high quality 10 meg movie. And in fact, if you looked at all the, the high capacity lines into homes, into businesses and so forth, I could be wrong by a factor of two here on a global basis, but about 400 million, say they're averaging 25 megabits a second, that's 10,000 terabits a second. That's pretty close to the 25,000 I'm talking about in the future that we would probably want to have. The last mile, the connection to the homes is not the problem in many countries. Sure, some places it is. In the third world, not many places. The problem is in the core of the internet. In what we call the cloud data centers, or the big carriers, the tier one backbones. And if you do the math there, there are not 100 major networks out there. They don't have anywhere near five terabits a second of capacity in the core, much, much less. So even allowing for growth, you're not going to probably even get close to 500 terabits a second in the cloud, what we all think of as the cloud. And this is not hard math to do. It's a tiny fraction. The capacity we're going to have is a tiny fraction of what we would need for you to be watching and everybody else to be watching the Netflix movies the way that they're done today, the way they're delivered. It doesn't exist. And you couldn't afford it. Probably couldn't afford the power to do it. That's a big challenge. How are we going to overcome that? All right, so that we can all do what we think we're going to do. In fact, I talked to CEOs of the world's largest carriers, and I, I talk about this issue, and, and they just had the idea, where are you going to deliver all these videos from at high quality? The cloud. Everything is going to come from the cloud. The cloud does not have the capacity we need. All right, the, uh, the last grand challenge is the enterprise network, you know, the companies of the world. And it uh, used to be fine. They have a private network, and you just connect every branch office to the corporate data center in the center, uh, and you would just do this. Well, now all the applications are in the cloud, or a lot of them. Software as a service, just using the internet. And the way they connect that is through their private network that's very expensive back to their enterprise data center, and then it goes out to the cloud. And before you know it, that's a very long path, and it doesn't have enough capacity. The typical branch office today needs 10x, maybe 100x more capacity. As an application, they want rich video. Well, we know video is a ton more bandwidth intensive than some numerical calculation where data was being passed. And so the capacity is not there, and the performance is terrible today in branch offices. And they got to figure out how do they move into the cloud, into the internet, and make it all work. All right, so those are four grand challenges. And this is why we created Akamai, OK, is to solve these problems. And our goal is to make the internet be fast, reliable, and secure, simply stated. So let me just tell you a little bit about how it works, our approach. And it's the same idea we started with 20 years ago as just doing mathematics. And the high level, the idea is very, very simple, is we want to place our computer servers in all the data centers out there. And more than that, anywhere we can get them, in thousands and thousands of places around the internet. We want our servers to be close to every end user in their city, in their neighborhood, in their carrier. So that when they want some content from one of our customers, it's nearby. They just go there, we've got the content, because we probably gave it to your neighbor, OK? And now it's sitting there for you. So it's really local, it's fast, it's scalable. And after all, there's a ton of capacity out here. This is where it's constrained. And rather than send that movie from here to every house, I just get it into the neighborhood once and then send it from there where there's the capacity, for example. Now, sometimes you need to communicate back to the data center because maybe you're checking your bank balance. Maybe you're buying something on eBay. And then they're going to keep your credit card 
behind a vault here in the data center. And maybe the path there is not doing so well. It would take a long time to get there, or maybe it's broken. And so we had to build our own virtual internet on top of the real internet, using our own communication protocols, our own routing protocols, our own application layer protocols. It's, we sort of had to build our own virtual internet the way here at MIT we would have built the internet if we could redo it. You know, just all our own protocols. Now, of course, you can never rebuild the internet. You can't, you can't do that. There's too many entities involved with it, never mind all the governments trying to do it. But we built our own virtual one that lives on top of it, so we'll find our own good route with very fast communication uh, over the existing internet. And all of our computers here we use as, well, routers as well to help route the traffic and diagnose what's going on. So we give very fast and reliable performance at enormous scale. And of course, once it's on the platform, we'll secure it. Now where we're going in the future, we want our software in every home, every office, and on every device. Now today we're doing that, our first endeavor to get into the, the branch offices is with Cisco. So if you buy the new Cisco branch office router, it comes with something they call Akamai Connect, which is our software. 40 million users have voluntarily downloaded Akamai software to help us to deliver gaming software, which decreases the cost for everybody and improves performance. And we're working with some of the major consumer electronic device companies to get our software into every home. Because if we can get our software into your garage, it'll be much better for you to watch all the movies you want to watch at very high quality. And it will be cheaper for everybody. Uh, today, we have a platform of over 170,000 servers. The number is not so important. What's important is they're in a zillion locations, in thousands of locations around the world close to end users. They're inside 1,300 networks, not just the 10 big ones. We're in 650 cities in over 100 countries. And we sell our services today to the major websites. So all top 60 e-commerce sites use this platform. When you go to eBay and PayPal and all the places you go, really you're coming to us. If you do it on the MIT campus, you're coming to an Akamai server on the MIT campus network. And your whole transaction is local. Now we'll go back to eBay and PayPal and get your bank balance or whatever it is that we need from that data center. But the vast majority of the content is already on that server near you. The big media and entertainment companies use us as well. We don't deliver most of Netflix videos and YouTube videos. Pretty much everything else, when you get a video, watch a sporting event, you're watching using Akamai. You don't know it, but your device is connecting to our device, and we'll send you the video you want to watch. Uh, we'll do 40 million transactions per second around the world. So two trillion a day, big, big number. And uh, typically on a daily basis, we're over 30 terabits a second. Seems big to us now. Then again, 10,000, 25,000 terabits a second could be coming, which is a whopper. Uh, so now just to say a few words about how we got started, because we obviously were not always this big. Uh, the ideas for this were part of academic research that began back in 1995 at CSAIL. My office was down the hall from Tim Berners-Lee, who's the father of the web as we know it. And uh, back then, Tim was worried about flash crowds or hotspots, the notion that a website would be in one place, and if a lot of people wanted to access the website, it would get crushed with traffic because all those requests would come to that one place. First famous example was the, uh, when Victoria's Secret went online, and they were one of the first e-commerce sites and they advertised their new e-commerce site during the 1999 Super Bowl. And of course, everybody watches the Super Bowl for the ads, and their ad is they had uh, models in lingerie walking down the runway. And uh, they said, if you want to see the, the full show, the fashion show for the lingerie, come to our website Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. I imagine the Super Bowl crowd, you know, a few beers watching that. And um, so Tuesday night at 9 o'clock, no one knows how many people went, but it not only took down their website, it took out the internet in Dallas and a large part of Texas. 
where it was hosted. And it made headlines across the country. Victoria's Secret crashes web. Now that was a big success for them then because they wanted people to know they had a website and that was accomplished. Of course, you know, you don't want to have that anymore. They want to conduct business on the internet. So this, you know, Tim talked to us and our group and this was right up our alley in terms of mathematics. We were mathematicians, mathematical computer scientists. Uh, no clue about anything practical, but it was large scale and it sounded practical and so we figured that if we did something that sounded practical, maybe we could get DARPA funding. And we did. We were the lone mathematicians, the token mathematicians that DARPA funded to work on algorithms for doing this kind of thing, routing uh, and distributed uh, delivery on the internet. We had no intention of forming a company. It was purely academic research. But in uh, the fall of 97, Danny Lewin, who's pictured here, is my graduate student, Believe it or not, that's me, before I had so much gray hair. Uh, Danny got the idea from his neighbor to enter the 50K competition. Now, that's the MIT student business plan competition, now called the 100K, it's gotten, gotten bigger. And Danny wanted to do it because he was going broke. Uh, he's a graduate student, he uh, had two kids in private school, and his wife didn't work. And back then, this is before Google's famous and before algorithms, suddenly re people realized that algorithms were important. And so we were at the bottom of the pay scale and he wanted to be a professor. And he's got mounting student loans. And so he was under the misimpression that if somehow he won the 50K, he'd get $50,000. And that would more or less pay off his student loans. Now, in fact, the winner, I think, got 30K, maybe 35, but you couldn't use it to pay off student loans. It had to go to start a company. But we didn't know that. In fact, we knew nothing about business. And uh, we actually went to the library and got books out how to write a business plan, literally. We got three books, read those. Uh, but we decided to enter the competition, you know, also as a learning experience. And once we got into it, we were, we were a pretty competitive group, you know. Uh, classic MIT type A personality, you just, you just want to win you know, the competition. And so we really got into it. And we learned a lot about business. We met VCs, and I didn't know what a VC was. Just to show you, and, and, I, and this is important because some of you, I know pro the process of thinking about starting a company may be worried that you don't know enough about business. You don't have to. You know, there's a lot of people who will help you learn that. I had no clue about business. Never even any intention to start a business. But the 50K competition was incredibly useful to us. At the end of it, we didn't win. We made the final six, which was, we were very excited about. Um, but then we saw the top teams, the ones that did win. And they were just much better than us because they had business experience and we didn't. And that really showed through. Uh, this was during the bubble in 98 when this happened. And so we were approached by VCs who said, let's start a company. You know, it's, it's the internet, it's MIT, it's sexy, we'll start a company and we'll all, we'll flip it and we'll all go home rich in six to 12 months. Now, to show you how clueless we were, we said no. That, uh, no, if we're gonna start a company, we want it to be successful. We weren't sure we had the right business plan yet. Uh, and we really didn't wanna start a company. I liked being a professor. Danny wanted to be a professor. And so we tried to get the technology license and to get the telcos and carriers to use it without success. They didn't think it would work. Distributed computing back then was an ivory tower concept, you know, and they said it'll never work. They talked to us because we were MIT, but they didn't believe us. Uh, you know, now today, of course, the world's different. This kind of stuff is what all the high tech companies are recruiting for. They want that kind of stuff but not back then. Now, at the end of the day, we did decide that the only way we'd ever have any impact with the technology was to do it ourselves because we couldn't get anybody else to take it. And so we had to do it and, uh, and it was our one chance as mathematicians, we felt, you know, as a career opportunity to make a difference with technology. So we did start the company in the fall of 98. We incorporated and uh, it was a great time because it was in the middle of the, of the bubble mania. Totally nuts. Uh, you know, very quickly we did an IPO. We were losing a fortune, almost no revenue. 
And you know, by the end of 99, after being public for two months with, I don't know, eight million in revenue and, and losing hundreds of millions of dollars a year, we were worth $35 billion. <laughs> uh, you know, you think there's a bubble today? That was a bubble. Uh, just, just nuts. Apple was our first strategic investor. Steve Jobs had tried to buy the company uh, early on, and we, we didn't want to sell, but we uh, did take Apple as our first investor. Their Akamai stock was worth more than the rest of Apple. Just how wacky times were. Now, of course, that was corrected, and then the bubble burst. <laughs> Extremely painful. We had to lay off two-thirds of the company. Uh, at the beginning of this time, the worst of tragedies of all, Danny Lewin was killed on September 11th on the first flight that went into the World Trade Center. Total, total devastating loss. Um, and we got to the point where everybody said we were dead. Now, the only silver lining was, since everybody thought we were dead, is we could use that to get out of all the money we owed. And uh, in particular, during the, the uh, smiley times here, we'd rented a ton of the floor space, office space in Cambridge, in Kendall Square. And at, at enormous rents that immediately dropped in half, and of course, instead of doubling from 1,500 people to 3,000, we went from 1,500 to 500. And we had all these long-term long -term debt worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, you know, we could very convincingly go and say, we'll pay you $5 million to erase the whole thing where you can get in line in bankruptcy court and get nothing. And we were convincing because it was, it was dire. We were down to a, a few months to live. Uh, but we managed through that. And, uh, in 2004, it became profitable, and we've been on a very good growth curve ever since. And so we were very excited uh, that you know, last year we hit the $2 billion mark in annual revenue, and we're now one of 11 internet software and services companies uh, to do that. So it's very exciting now to be able to, to be growing. And so now we have over 5,000 employees growing to uh, 6,000 this year. And working on really fun, hard problems. You know, these grand challenges are really tough, but they'll make a difference. They're, they're important. OK, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and see if there's any questions. All right, questions? No questions? There we go. Jeff again. So trying to decide whether the page you've got is current or not. At what level are you deciding? Is it at the page level? Is it the object level? Explain how all that's going on. It's at every level. Uh, and we have to be really precise that it's current. Uh, so a customer can change the price on something, and it has to go out immediately. So there's a lot of different technologies we had to build to make sure we never serve anything that's even a, a second stale from when the customers decided that it's time to go. Wonderful, enjoyed it. Um, do you plan to address all the challenges simultaneously, or are they sequential? How does that work? We're working on all four. Uh, you know, and one of the nice things about you know, the chief scientist becoming CEO is now I can actually spend some money. <laughs> you know, and uh, we can fund these four projects. You know? uh, and so we are growing, and we are working on all four at the same time. Uh, and, of course, the, you know, we, to fund that, we have to be bringing in the revenue, which we are. Media is growing quite a bit, brings in a lot of revenue. Our products to make the web be a lot faster and mobile devices be faster. The commerce companies pay us a lot of money to do that. Our security business, which we uh, really began commercially in 2012, now brings in a quarter billion dollars a year. And so that's very helpful. So we can take that money and plow it back in into solving these problems, uh, with the enterprise networking business just starting now. Jason? Could you say a word about the culture of Akamai? I have a friend who works for you, and I hear some pretty cool stories, but specifically culture relating to innovation. Yeah, innovation is critical, just as important today, if not more so, than it was when we started. Uh, the, the landscape moves very fast. You know, you look at RIM. It's like, oh my goodness. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we'd look up to RIM as one of the fast growing companies. And then, you know, it's like, oh my goodness. Uh, so our culture is very MIT like, if you're familiar with the MIT culture. 
Uh, people work very hard. They work smart. They work as a team. It's about solving the problem. No problem is too hard to solve. Uh, if you work as a team and you go after it, uh, do what it takes to make the customer happy. Uh, it's all about the customer at the end of the day. They're, you know, they're giving us the money that we can use to, to do these, you know, work on these hard problems to solve them. Um, it's a highly innovative culture. It's a culture where, you know, rank doesn't matter so much. It's more the value of the idea. You know, I, to this day, I love it. Now I'm, I'm CEO, I love it when the most junior new intern from MIT comes and teaches me something or shows that I was wrong about something, that's great. You know, and so that's the kind of a culture. It's the quality of the idea, not, not your rank. And uh, as we get bigger, we do struggle more getting the innovations out there fast. You know, so it's, we got lots of great ideas, but getting them in the products that all of a sudden can be, you know, multi-hundred million dollar businesses, and that's a problem we're working on. How do we make that happen faster? Because as you get bigger, it's, you know, you, it's, you can block good ideas. There are more people who can say no. Um, and so that's coming, you know, is an important part of my job is how do we get ideas to have oxygen uh, and get them into products faster. Hi. Over the next five years, there's the expectation that uh, genomics data are going to grow exponentially and there'll be a need to move those data around as well. Have you spent time at Akamai thinking about this problem and how you may be a part of the solution? Yeah, only a little bit. And I think you're absolutely right. In fact, if I was look, to look at an area besides the internet, which I'm pretty excited about, you know, that I think will make a big difference, it's genomics, you know, the human genome, manipulating that to cure disease, all sorts of, I think, really cool things. That's massive amounts of data, massive amounts of computation, you know, involved with that. And uh, we're not, I would say, engaged in that today. Uh, but obviously that's an area where the kinds of things we're doing may come to bear in our customer base as we move into health sciences and you know, biology companies, which we're starting to move into that vertical now. How do you speed the transmission of the data? How do you store it in a cost-effective way? We're at the back. Michelle? Thank you, great presentation. Uh, how uh, portable have you found your underlying technology platform to be as traffic moves from websites to mobile devices to wearable devices and Internet of Things where, you know, it's literally on a person as opposed to a local data center? Yeah, so uh, today pretty much we live in the local data centers or POPs uh, and we're working hard to get our software out into all the devices. Uh, so we're on actively using 40 million client devices today. We're in branch office routers now. Uh, we'd like to be in everything. On a session based, today if you go to any major e-commerce site, they're using us. We actually put our software on your mobile device through JavaScript today and it lasts for the session. We really want to be resident on your device and we're working with the big device companies to try to get there. It's really hard, you know, for, to get the permissions to get there. But if we could be on your device, we could do very cool things for you. We could make your battery last longer, make the web seem even faster, figure out ahead of time what you're going to want to see, and get the bits there ready to go so when you click, it really is instant. You're not trying to get it all through the tower. Just the OK would come through the tower and everything else is there. Uh, so technology-wise, we can do it. Our challenge there is the business relationships to enable it. Because uh, we just, you know, can't force ourselves on every Apple device or every Samsung device. We gotta, you know, get get that to happen through business. Sorry, just to follow up on that, um, you mentioned that a lot of this is behind the scenes. I'm curious, uh, from an from a demand side, is there an interest in trying to push the brand further into the consumer? awareness or, you know, put a little stamp on a device that says this is Akamai powered or, or whatever? Yeah, we, we talk about that at least once a year because uh, we spend no money on consumer branding. Uh, we do advertise among our customer base, which would be a CIO, for example. Um, you know, and so far we haven't found a good justification to do it. You know, it would be nice for recruiting. Our employees would feel better because their families 
never heard of Akamai, and their friends never heard of Akamai, and that's sort of discouraging. You know, you'd like everybody to know what we do. They're all using Akamai, but nobody knows it. And we just haven't found the right, you know, justification uh, to, to, to uh, afford it. You know, the sites we carry, you say, well, why don't you have, you know, powered by Akamai on the site? Well, they would charge us more than they're paying us to deliver the site. So it's upside down. Now, when we do charitable things, that's where you'll see it. But not many people go to those sites. So, yeah. Do you have presence in the developing world or any plans to move that way? Yeah, we have servers there, obviously a lot less, you know, than we would have in the developed world. So, you know, you go to New York and there's hundreds of locations. You go to, you know, pick your favorite country in Africa, hit and miss if we have any location there. Um, we are growing, you know, in the third world, but our, our deployment depends on the demand from the end users, and that's just getting started. Most of that's going to be through cellular communications. And we are now working with the big cellular carriers, you know, to help them have better delivery and lower cost of delivery to the end users. So probably won't be a direct business, but it'll be indirect through the major carriers in the third world. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of buzz out there, I think mostly in the wake of Snowden's, you know, disclosures. And there's, um, and certain governments are getting, you know, more rigid about control of the infrastructure in their country. Uh, obviously, there's certain countries that don't want certain content, you know, getting into their country. Uh, and that does complicate things. I, I don't think the internet's going to get balkanized, you know, as some people have talked about. I do think everything is going to go to SSL or HTTPS. Everything's going to be encrypted. Uh, and you're seeing that happen very quickly. And that is highly disruptive to the carriers because it means that, well, they can't wiretap, uh, which they do for every local government. And it means they can't do their own optimizations of caching and stuff like that because they can't see what's in the content. So highly disruptive to a bunch of big companies and big carriers, but that's going to happen, I think, over the course of the next year or two. And the big tech companies are pushing it. A lot of the governments want it, um, you know, because of all the disclosures. You know, and in Germany in particular, ever since it was disclosed that we were wiretapping Merkel, that, that's a painful place for American companies now, you know, to try to sell stuff. They want to keep all the content in country. Okay. Well, thank you, Tom. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. That was that was an amazing talk. <laughs> <laughs>